Jenny, welcome to the program. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. I hear that we may be seeing an expansion of the HPV vaccine program to include boys. Can you just talk us through where we're up to with that vaccine program and whether or not that's true, whether we're going to see boys included in the program? Yes, the government has agreed to roll out the program of vaccination against HPV for boys starting in 2013. So boys in year seven will be offered free vaccination, that's boys aged 12 to 13, and they're going to do a catch-up program, so boys aged 14 and 15 will also be vaccinated. So that's years um, eight and nine will also over the next two years be offered the vaccination as well. So that's just the news that we've been waiting for such a long time. We're really excited. But is HPV associated with any actual um, pathology in relation to boys or is it just to do with the overall public health? Um, the vaccination that's being offered for boys is the same as girls. So the, it covers four different viruses in the vaccine. So two that are linked to cancer and two virus strains that are linked to genital warts. So boys do get genital warts and we want to prevent them getting that infection. But also boys, there's an epidemic now amongst some men who are actually getting um, anal cancer in alarming rates. And also they're actually finding that um, men are at an increased risk of getting throat cancer. And so we believe the vaccine's going to reduce anal cancer, reduce warts, and also throat cancer and penile cancer. So an extraordinary outcome for the boys and really very much needed. How will that extension then be rolled out? It, will it be done through schools or...? So the government has chosen to fund the vaccination for boys in addition to the girls that already fund. So that funds it. But it's also important to realise that for people who weren't vaccinated at school, that if they're in the age group of risk and they've missed out, then they can go to their GP and the GP can actually apply to get extra um, vaccination and give them the catch-up vaccine that way, or that can be done through their local councils. But the vaccines are actually licensed in boys up to the age of 25 and in women up to the age of 45. So older men and older women can in fact be vaccinated through their GP, but in that case the government's not paying for it and the individual needs to pay. It's actually three injections and if they have to pay for it, it is quite expensive. So the government's being very generous funding a vaccine that normally costs $150 per injection. Three injections are required, so say we have one injection today, the next one's due in two months, and then the final injection is given at six months. And all three injections are thought to be required to actually produce effect. So people aren't covered from the vaccine until the final injection is actually given. Is there a lifespan for the, for the efficacy of the vaccine? The moment there's only data in women up to about seven years, and that's shown to be very good at the moment, that the memory of the vaccines um, lasting for a long time. Uh, whether, in fact, a booster will be required down the track, we don't know. But at the moment, the data is excellent, that in the really sexually active age groups, it's holding, so no booster is currently required. If people are vaccinated then against HPV, is that, that's obviously protective against cervical cancer, but, it, but does it eliminate the need for um, monitoring? The question really is, do women have to keep having pap smears even though they've been vaccinated? And at this point in time, the answer to that is yes. We want women to keep having their pap smears every two years. Now, it's very likely in the future things are going to change. Um, it's go and it'll be driven by advances in technology and also more about the understanding of disease. But in the future, it's likely the screening interval might be extended 
um, maybe up to every five years, but there has to be a national committee to examine and give guidelines. And the other thing is that it's possible in the future we may go to just testing for strains of virus and then just doing the pap smear component on those women that actually test positive. So, but at the moment there are more strains of human papillomavirus that can cause cancer than are actually in the vaccine. Mm. So it's very important that women continue with their pap smears, just in case they've got one of the unusual strains that aren't actually covered. Is there anything else other than the presence of HPV that can result in cervical cancers? Not as far as we understand. Basically, they've looked at lots of cervical cancers and they found some strain of human papillomavirus in nearly 100%. You know, the data is like 99.7%, so that's 100%. So all cervical cancer is believed to be due to human papillomavirus. And it's the same with anal cancer, that they think most anal cancers now are due to human papillomavirus as well. It's almost ubiquitous in the environment. The lifetime risk of a woman actually catching some sort of strain of human papillomavirus and getting abnormalities on her cervix is 80%. So it's extraordinarily high. And these are invisible changes. That's why we have to do the cell tests or tests of the virus to actually find the disease. So the, the, the other thing that's really involved with reducing cancers in countries like Australia and Sweden has been their pap smear recall program. So active um, government-sponsored programs that really do remind people to come back and have their tests has been shown to be one of the key factors as well. But Australia is leading the world now. We're the first country in the world to be offering the vaccination to boys and we were the first country in the world to be offering it to um, girls. And the other evidence from vaccination programs too has been that if you give it to school children, then your uptake is much more successful than if it's given later. But we need to give the vaccine early, so before people start sexual experimentation, and that starts quite early in quite a few communities. Are we having an impact on the rates of cervical cancer? It's um, a little bit early to evaluate the effect of the vaccination program on cervical cancer, but already, again, Australia has been the first country in the world to actually demonstrate that the rates of genital warts in women have fallen very dramatically um, since the vaccination has um, been introduced. And um, also there's been other data published that sh has shown that the rate of cell abnormalities, the pap smear abnormalities, has actually fallen since the introduction of vaccination as well. So um, we need time, because if you get infected with HPV, it can take anywhere from 9 to 40 years to get a cancer. So it's going to take quite some time to demonstrate that cervical cancer rates have fallen, but at the moment the precursors that lead to cancer are reducing, so very positive signs that this vaccination is really doing what it was intended to do. What are the things that GPs can be doing or should be thinking about in relation to maximising that for their individual patients, but also in a public health perspective? I think GPs should be um, asking women if they've been vaccinated, um, encouraging those who weren't vaccinated to be vaccinated. I think there is a lot of room to encourage women who can afford to have their own vaccines to still be vaccinated because the truth is that even though they might have already got one sort of HPV, it's very unlikely that they will have got all the types of vaccine or all the HPV types in the vaccine. So there's still benefit. The other thing we know about society now is there's a lot of marital breakups and so it gives people protection for the future with future partners. And I think the other message is that human papillomavirus is sexually transmitted 
but they need to think about other sexually transmitted infections as well and we want to know that people are HIV negative we, and testing for chlamydia in young girls and boys is really important. And especially in the rural areas, we know that chlamydia is really epidemic. So a urine test in girls and boys for chlamydia is really something that I would really like to see a big increased uptake in. So the message that I'd really like to get across at this stage is check to make sure that your patients have been vaccinated, check to make sure that they've had all three injections, um, for those who are still in the school age, um, then they'll be able to get the vaccine free through either the health department or the council. And think about chlamydia testing, just urine testing in girls and boys as well.